Well, this morning I want to talk to you and look at some very important things. Uh, the book of Romans chapter 3, some questions are asked that they want to have some answers from Paul. You see, the Jewish people have been put in a corner. They have been shown that, turns out, their heritage, who they are, the fact that they have the law, their rituals, the marks that define them as being Jewish, in their mind, didn't save them. And so they wonder, Paul, what's the point? And so they ask three very important questions of Paul. The biggest one fitting with the idea is, Paul, is there really then any advantage at all to being Jewish? Because what they look at is they say, Paul, you, you have said that it's our fault that God's name is actually being blasphemed among the Gentiles. Because that's what he said in Romans chapter 2, verse 24, when he says, As it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, if you're Jewish, you think, can it get any worse? What's the point? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. What's the point? And as we look at that from our point of view, we'll learn a little bit more about our God about his nature, and I think we'll find some hope, too. Why don't we have a word of prayer as we get ready to dig into God's word? Our Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be in your word, for the privilege that we have that you have given your truth to us. Lord, that you have opened eyes that we might understand, that you have opened ears that we might hear. So, Lord, let us be attentive to you. Father, I ask very specifically that you would speak through me, that it would be your voice that is talking and not mine, that you would convey your truth, your wisdom, and that, Lord, I would just completely disappear. For, Lord, I know that if it's just Tom Ricker standing up here, we're all in a lot of trouble. But, Father, if you speak, if your spirit moves, well, God, we can really get to worshiping, and we can be changed. So I ask for you to work today. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 1. How many of you thought we'd actually get through those first two chapters? Well, here we are. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 1, and the questions begin. So, what advantage does the Jew have? Or what benefit is circumcision? And Paul asks these questions for a reason here in Romans chapter 3, verse 1, because he's going back to the book of Ecclesiastes. He's drawing back to the way Solomon would ask questions and would, would say things that were to draw upon a conclusion. In fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, Verse 3, he says, what does a man gain for all of his efforts he labors at under the sun? A little later, he asks another question, chapter 6, verse 8. What advantage then does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage is there for the poor person who knows how to conduct themselves before others? In Ecclesiastes 6, verse 11, he says, well, just plain put it this way. What advantage does man have? What advantage does man have? What is the advantage for man? And how many of you know that this guy writing Ecclesiastes constantly says things like meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. The point is, in and of itself, is there any advantage? No. In and of itself, there's nothing. But in God, now there's some advantage, right? How we behave when we're in Him, there's opportunity. There's blessing. But in our own strength, in our own will, in our own power, what good is there? Paul has pushed himself at this point in Romans and his fellow Jews into a corner. He has backed them up. Now, 
They talk about people have two natural fl- natural tendencies, right? Fight or flight. <laughs> well, guess what? Paul's assuming fight. So they start barking back. And that's what Paul's assuming is, is they're going to come back. But Paul, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Paul. What about this? And Paul brings up three very specific objections to what he's just said about the Jewish people and about their situation. And the first one is this. Paul, you are undermining the covenant. Don't you see what you're doing, Paul? You are undermining things. What is the benefit of even being Jewish then, Paul? Wait a minute, God made a covenant with us. What's the point then if, if, if we're all just lost anyways? If what you said is true, what good is there in even being a Jew? You see, the Jews had taken pride in saying... Well, as I said in Luke chapter 3, verse 8, we have Abraham as our father. And that was a lot of pride to that. They also had a lot of sayings in their prayer books that weren't scripture, but somewhat scripturally based. All Israel has a share in the world to come. Well, they looked at their prophecies, they saw that. Well, maybe it's not all, but Israel has a share in the world to come. And they would pray, you have chosen us from among all the peoples. Well, that's true. That's in Scripture. But they're looking at those things and saying, well, if we're all just lost and dying and headed to hell anyways, just like the Gentile, Paul, what are you doing? What's the point of this big covenant? What's the big deal? I thought we were special. Is there really any benefit to this at all, Paul? And Paul answers in verse 2 of Romans 3, considerable. In every way. And then he says, first, they were entrusted with the spoken words of God. And Paul thinks that's a pretty big deal. He says, it's great. The advantage of being a Jew is is great. He says, don't misunderstand, there's a lot of advantage. Well, being a Jew didn't bring automatic salvation as some understood There were privileges. Those Jewish people who followed God were given exclusive promises and covenants that are not applied to the rest of the world. They were also promised that the Savior of the world would be of Jewish descent. Think about that for a minute. They were special, they were blessed. This nation of Israel was delivered like no other nation in history. I mean, the focus, it's interesting, the focus of Jewish people today is on the negative that happened rather than on the deliverance. They focus on the Holocaust rather than we were saved from that. By the way, you know any people in your life that do those kind of things too? They can't seem to see the good that happened. All they can see is that negative thing that occurred. And it seems like no matter what time you talk to them, what day you talk to them, things are bad. See, God had done a lot of delivering for Israel. Despite the fact of their sin getting them into those situations. Would God have been just in not delivering them because of their sin? Sure. But instead, he chooses to deliver. But the focus then becomes, but look how long we were in this situation. Paul says, guys, there's a lot of advantage. God keeps delivering. We have been given the oracles of God. Think about that for a minute. 64 out of 66 books were given to us by God through Jewish authors. The exceptions being Job, which was written before there were Jews. And possibly Luke, although depending on who you talk to, some people think he was Jewish and some people think he wasn't. So I'm just throwing it out there because he may not have been. And so two possible books out of the entire Bible weren't written by Jews. That's a pretty big deal, right? The Bible is a Jewish book, right? We all get that? New Testament, Old Testament, Jewish book. It was written by Jewish people about a Jewish God bringing a Jewish Savior, a Jewish Messiah. That means 
They're pretty special, wouldn't you agree? All these religious books out there, all these things, I mean, it could have been that God gave it to some nation in Africa, some nation in, a, in Asia, some nation in Europe, some nation in North America, South America, but God didn't. He gives it to this little tiny group. His oracles, His truth, revealing Himself in a way that even the world around us doesn't reveal. Paul says, guys, it's a pretty big deal. You can know me like no other nation ever knew me, and you'll know it first, because I gave it to you. But, with great benefit comes great responsibility. How many of you were ever Spider-Man fans? That sounds a little familiar? It's a biblical principle. (laughs) Amos chapter 3 verse 2 says, I have known only you out of all the clans of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities, for all your iniquities. Hebrews 10, 26, 27 makes it clearer this way. It says, for if we deliberately sin after receiving the knowledge of truth, there is no long, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. Think about this. Having been given the oracles of God, yeah, there's a huge advantage. <laughs> because they have an opportunity to walk with him faithfully and to know him better than if they'd never been given that, right? However, if they've been given that and then still choose not to walk with him, they will be held that much more responsible. Christian, this should be of concern to us. <laughs> we have been shown the grace of God. We have been covered by the blood of Jesus. If we choose to use that as a license, what will God have to say to us? Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 3. It's not in your slide, so don't go to another slide yet. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We talk about how Christians are safe from the judgment, and yes, we are. Sort of. Chapter 3 and verse 10. According to God's grace that was given to me as a skilled master builder, I have laid a foundation, Paul says, and another builds on it. But each one must be careful how he builds on it. Because no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid. That is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious. This is where concern should come in. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. And we're all like, that's what we look forward to, right? We all talk about the reward we'll get when we get to heaven, the crowns and all this wonderful stuff. But let's keep going to the next verse. If anyone's work is burned up, it will be lost. But he will be saved. Yet it will be like an escape through fire. My brother's a firefighter. He talks about this verse a lot with me. He says, you don't want to escape through fire, Tom. He goes, because you don't leave unscathed. You don't leave without some effect. He goes, sure, you're safe. You survived. And the, the guy surviving the fire is grateful for surviving the fire. But they lose things in the survival of the fire. Now, don't get me wrong. Salvation is salvation, right? I mean, the options are salvation or not salvation. Even saved through fire is a huge upgrade over what we deserve. But having been saved and entrusted with the word of God and given understanding as to what he expects out of us as believers and walking in the light, Christians, yeah, we won't lose our salvation But there will come a point where we'll be held responsible for how we've behaved 
having been made his children. Well, this is the first objection. Maybe there's no advantage at all. You've destroyed the covenant. Paul says, that's not true. I haven't destroyed the covenant. The covenant still stands. There's great advantage to being Jewish. So they come up with another objection. Paul, you don't get it. You're just nullifying God's promises by this. You're nullifying his promises. And in verse 3 of Romans 3, he says, what then? If some did not believe, will their unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? Absolutely not, Paul says. God must be true, but everyone is a liar, as it is written. And here he quotes Psalm 51, see if this sounds familiar. That you may be justified in your words and triumph when you judge. Jewish unfaithfulness. You see, most Jews, even today, do not believe the gospel message to which God's oracles point. You are aware, of course, I'm assuming at this point, that all of the Old Testament points towards the cross of Christ, towards the coming of Jesus. The first messianic prophecy happens in Genesis chapter 3, and from Genesis chapter 3, at that very moment of the very first sin, God starts the motion. And so it all was to be looking forward towards that day. And yet, the Jews who were given this word, they didn't believe. The reality is, their individual unfaithfulness excludes them from the covenant blessing and promises given to Israel by God, individually. Interestingly enough, in the book of Ezekiel, which we were studying in Sunday school, we looked at some of that. We saw some of that. And we also saw the same promise given that, you know, even though God was destroying and would wipe out, and that there was a remnant held on to. Because this rejection of God's invitation doesn't change his promise, his word. And this was the concern. Does it lead to the conclusion that God would not fulfill his promise? Does it lead to the conclusion they're looking and saying, well, wait, if there's no advantage for the Jews, and if there's... Paul, it sounds like you're saying we're all headed to hell. But what about God's promise? What about, what about his promise, Paul? Valid question, right? And that's where, that's where they're at. What about this? Well, God is still faithful, isn't he? No matter how men act, God will still be faithful to his word, won't he? That's good news, isn't it? And this is what Paul's getting at. He says, look, that may be true. You may look and see that there's a disadvantage because all of a sudden it's not about the national identity anymore. It's about the individual within that national identity. And that the individual can be excluded, right? By the way, that works in church too, doesn't it? You can come here 40 years, sit under Pastor Paul's teaching, Pastor Mike's teaching, and have heard every single message and still find yourself excluded, can't you? Because if all you did was listen, it didn't matter. Well, the same thing with the Jewish people. They were born Jewish, they were born with that opportunity, and yet if they did not turn to follow God, they weren't going to personally get to take part in that promise. You see, there are different kinds of promises to Israel, and the unconditional promises were made to the nation as a whole, and not every single individual Jew. And that's the important thing we need to understand. This is why we get comments about remnants, about some being preserved. And we heard that phrase remnant several times in our Sunday school class, in the adult Sunday school today, when um, it was talked about how the people in Jerusalem thought they were the remnant. <laughs> But they weren't. For those who had been exiled were actually the remnant that God would preserve, that God would maintain. And you say, wait a minute, they were taken from the promised land. How could they be the remnant? Well, God was taking them out so that he could deal with justice and deal with those who would choose to be wicked. Look at Isaiah chapter 44, verses 1 through 5 with me. Isaiah chapter 44, verses 1 through 5. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to give you a chance so you can turn there in your Bible, even though I have it up here in case you don't have one. It's always good for us to use the Bible we have, right? Right? 
Isaiah chapter 44, verses 1 through 5. And now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is the word of the Lord, your maker, who shaped you from birth. He will help you. Do not fear, Jacob is my servant. I have chosen Jeshurun. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. They will sprout among the grass like poplars by the stream bed. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will write on his hand, the Lord, and name himself by the name of Israel. What a promise to the Jewish people, right? Their identity is sure. It's solid. It, it, will, it will happen. It's not going to get lost. But he didn't say on all your descendants, did he? On every single individual. It's that overall picture. This is important. So many times we look at these kind of things and we, we, we group. And we put ourselves under an umbrella. And this is what Israel has done. This is what the Jewish people have done. They put themselves completely under that umbrella at this point in time. And now I won't say that today. We want to be careful. Understand we're, we're looking here in the first century. But they had put themselves under this umbrella and saying, this promise must be true of us. And see, we're safe. We are his descendants. We are those people that God has protected us. Christian, if you are living a life that is walking in sin, is God going to protect you? You say, well, what about the promises? God has also promised in the book of Hebrews that he will discipline those that are his children. It is protection, you're right, but it's not what we often think of as protection. Because you see, discipline is unenjoyable, isn't it? We have a lot of fathers here. How many of you had your child thank you last time you had to discipline them? Woo! Please, sir, may I have another? No? Okay, i got to take my brother out of that picture. He would say, do it again. He, he is a weird little kid. Uh, but most of the time, the kid doesn't ask for another, another helping of discipline. But we understand that if we are his and we walk away, that he will discipline because he wants us. In fact, Paul warns that if we aren't disciplined when we walk away, that we should be concerned. Not Paul, but the writers of Hebrew. That might be Paul, we don't know. But that we ought to be concerned. Because God disciplines those who are his, and if you aren't disciplined, you are what? Not his. It's kind of one of those easy, if, if he disciplines those who are his, then those who aren't, aren't disciplined. In fact, the opposite happens. They are under judgment instead. So Paul points out, yes, these, these things are true, and God is, is fair, but there are different kinds of promises to Israel. Individual enjoyment of covenant blessings is always dependent upon their faithfulness to being a part of that. That's important. It's a little part that we often don't notice. Abraham was blessed and is part of, the, of, a, of a covenant because he trusted God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's important. What if, what if God had made the promise, made the call, and all these things, and, and Abraham was like, that sounds good, I'm going to stay right here, though. Would we have the same story and account in our word? No. See, he believed God. And because he believed God, he did something. Now, the unbelief of some, and this is what's beautiful, and this is what Paul's getting at, look, guys, just because a few don't believe doesn't change God's promise, does it? doesn't change that he's faithful, and he will be faithful. So Paul, Paul's response to the objection is a very severe no. Very severe, because he does it in the most absolute way that he can in the Greek. Absolutely not. God must be true, but everyone is a liar. Verse 
as it is written that you may be justified in your words and triumph when you are judged. You see, man can't nullify our God's faithfulness, can we? In fact, Paul does write later to, um, I'm going to get this book wrong, I believe it's Titus, and he says, you know, even when we are faithless, still, he is faithful. Even when we are faithless, he is faithful. We cannot, even as believers, we cannot nullify the faithfulness of our God. Isn't that great to know? Now, the sum in verse 3, who were unfaithful, remember he said, what if some are unfaithful? The sum in verse 3 implies that there would be some that have faith, wouldn't it? If there's a sum, not an all. So if some are unfaithful, that implies some who are faithful. God has always shown throughout scriptures that he maintains a remnant. Isn't that wonderful? You see, Joshua and Caleb were a very small remnant, weren't they? Way back in Numbers chapter 14, when you see those, those spies go out, the spies go out, only two come back and say, hey, God promised this is ours, so let's take it. What did the other ten say? Let's not take it. And what does Israel listen to as a whole? Let's go with the ten. And so what does God say? All right, I will keep two. I will keep two. He wipes out the rest of that generation. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? Two people were the remnant from that generation. So sometimes the remnant gets small, doesn't it? The book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 2 through 4, 4, point out a great picture of this as well. And this is why it's also important for us to understand, yes, God can allow these things to get very small, but God can also be doing something that we're unaware of. And Romans 11, verse 2 says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the Elijah section? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets, torn down your altars, and, and I'm the only one left. And they're trying to kill me. They're trying to take my life. And I love verse 4. But what was God's reply to him? I have left 7,000 men for me, for myself who have not bowed down to Baal. Think about that. Here he is, and he is looking at the world around him. Everybody's being killed. Nobody's following God. He's like, it's all over, God. And they're trying to get me. Just... There's no hope. You, you've done it, God. You, you, haven't, you haven't preserved your people. They're going to kill me. And then who will worship you? First of all, anytime we start asking God those kind of questions, we should realize we're, we're probably off here, right? Because God is in control, isn't he? All the time. And this was God's point when he says this to Elijah. He's like, Elijah, it's not like you think. It's not as bad as it looks. In fact, he says, Elijah, you know what? Not only are you not the only one, I've got 7,000 other guys that are faithful to me, that aren't worshiping Baal. How do you think Elijah felt at that moment? I know how I'd feel, about like that. You're like, okay, I need to change my perspective a little bit. That's what Elijah needed, didn't he? He needed a reality check. See, the reality was that he didn't really know the condition of the world. He didn't know the condition of Israel. Yeah, it wasn't good, was it? We know it wasn't good. But it wasn't as bad as he thought. He wasn't the only one. That's good news, right? So often churches can get into that mindset. I've watched little churches where they think we're the only ones faithful in the whole city. Come on, guys. Really? That's usually when I, I've tried to challenge people. Maybe you need to act, interact more with the people around you to find out who's walking with God. Because I'm betting there's more. How many of you know there's going to be more than just Grace Brothers in heaven? Pretty fair to say that, right? Good. <laughs> There's a joke that goes around every so often, and it changes depending on the denom denomination you're in. And what it is, is a, a Methodist preacher goes to heaven, and God is walking him around heaven. 
And he's walking, and they see some people from the Assembly of God churches. They're over there worshiping. And as they keep walking, they see some people from the Baptist, Southern Baptist churches, and they're over there worship, worshiping, and see some people from the AME churches, and they're worshiping. And then they see this little cornered off section. He's like, who are those? He's like, come here. They look in the window. He's like, those are the Grace Brethren people. He goes, they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> we want to be careful not to do that, right? To think we're the only ones. Paul's response to the question is so strong because the Greek uses the strongest negative expression possible containing the implication of the impossibility of this happening. That there's just not even a possible way for this to occur. Even if every human who ever lived declared that God was a liar, that the Bible wasn't true, God would still be proven true while all of mankind would be shown to be liars. In fact, we're told that God keeps His word. That He does what He's promised He will do. And Paul quotes then David in Psalm 51.4, Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight, so you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. And what we see in the context of why Paul chose this passage is that God is not only faithful in His promises, He is faithful when He gives a warning. You see, God is, God's justice is vindicated by His punishment in that specific instance of David's sin. He was just in what He was doing. David knew it. He knew he'd done wrong and that when God judged him and did what he did, that it was the right thing for God to do and that God was just because God had warned that if you sin against him, there will be a result. And David knew it. And he was greatly concerned. If you know the story, David went into the temple and he just prayed and begged and begged and begged, please no God, please no. I know I did wrong, please don't, not this. And God didn't listen, did he? God said, this is, this is justice. You've chosen sin, and this is what will happen. God's judgment, therefore, also proves his faithfulness. See, man's faithlessness, when judged by God, serves to demonstrate that God is faithful, rather than detracting from it, for he is being faithful to the warnings and his promises that he gave. You see, if God is going to warn that he will judge the whole world, then what happens if he doesn't? He's, he's not faithful, is he? What's the point of the whole book of Revelation at that point, right? What about all the prophecies? What about the warnings in Numbers and the warnings in Deuteronomy and the warnings in Joshua? I mean, God gives warnings like this all throughout his Bible about doing wrong and the result that will happen. If God does not hold up his end of the bargain on that, then he is a faithless God and one not to be trusted. At which point, our salvation would be on shaky ground, wouldn't it? Because if you have a faithless God, how do you know your salvation is sure? By the way, some make these kind of charges today. They say, how can God be loving? How can God be faithful? How can God be good if he sends some to hell? And they think they have a good point. They say, they say well, but if most people don't believe the gospel, hasn't God failed in his purpose to save the world? And they usually recite the one verse that they know in scripture. Doesn't it say, for God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Didn't God fail if people are going to go to hell? And they think they've got this great point. What makes me sad is too often Christians don't have a response. They stand there like, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I hadn't thought about it that way. Our response is, no, God is faithful. He has warned. We understand that. Think about it. From the beginning of time, people get the picture, don't they? God made sure the picture got across right away. He didn't wait and let Adam sin and then let another sin happen and Cain and Abel did all their sinning and still God waited because he's like, no, I'm not going to judge him yet. No. Immediate, Right? It doesn't take Genesis chapter 10 before we see any kind of result for what they chose to do against God. God wanted the picture to be understood immediately, that there is a result, a response to wickedness, to disobedience. 
In fact, he is warned that all will be judged. And today, he provides an opportunity. Today, he provides an opportunity to all who would choose to turn away from sin and choose to turn towards him. That's the response. God is faithful. And he's faithful in all aspects, both in the promises and in the warnings. So having dealt with that, there's one final objection they make. And say, well, wait a minute then, Paul. Based on what you're saying, you are making God unjust. And they think they have him. You're making him unjust, Paul. Based on what you're saying, God wouldn't be just in judging. And so he goes on. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 5. But if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what are we to say? And Paul then says, I use a human argument. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? Absolutely not. Otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if my if by my lie, God's truth is amplified to his glory, then why should I still be, why am I still judged as a sinner? If what I do, he's saying, if what I do amplifies God's glory, then shouldn't I be let go because it made God look better? And why not say, just as some people slanderously claim we say, let us do evil so that good may come. Paul's response to that one isn't to respond, really, is it? At that point, he just says, their condemnation is deserved. So the question becomes, is it fair for God to judge men for things that will demonstrate God's glory? Is it fair for God to judge men for doing things that will demonstrate God's glory? seems to be a logical conclusion. By the way, I, I loved taking philosophy classes in college. Oh, I couldn't get enough of them. If I had had time to get a degree in philosophy as well as everything else I was doing, but five years of school was enough at that point, so I, I stopped. <laughs> Crammed a whole four years into five. It was worthwhile. It seems like this is what chapter 3 the last part of verse 4 is saying when it says, you may be justified in your words and triumph when you judge. See, God is justified by judging. He is victorious in how He judges and when He does it. So if God is these things, isn't the person being judged helping Him out? Making Him look good? So man's wickedness shows God's glory and His righteousness. And the question is, if that's true, isn't that a good thing? Isn't it? It goes on to say, it then, the argument would be, if our unrighteousness, if me being wicked, is to God's advantage, that is, it displays his righteousness, then why should I be punished? By the way, when I was in high school, I loved using these kind of arguments. It never worked for me either, but I really tried. So if I could find a way to get away with something, that's the kind of kid I was. I wanted to get away with it. God bless my parents for their patience. <laughs> it seems to be a logical conclusion, though. If a good end, that is God's glory, is served by the means, my faithfulness, why should the means, my sin, be punished? I mean, this is the idea, right? The end justifies the means. You've heard that. That's a big way of thinking. But God is about to turn that on his head and say, that's ridiculous. How many of you knew that idea was pre presented in Romans, that the end justifies the means? And Paul says, basically, this is absurd. This is a rude thing to say. And such thinking and actions violate God's nature. Because he says, if this were true... God couldn't judge anyone. Look at verse 6. Romans 3 and verse 6. I've got to get back from our last passage there. Romans 3 and verse 6. 
Otherwise, how will God judge the world? The idea is, if God's unrighteous to inflict wrath, if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, and so he would be unrighteous to cause, to judge, how in the world will God actually judge the world if that would make him unrighteous? And yet we're told he will, aren't we? Psalm chapter 50, verse 6 says, The heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God is the judge. Did you know the heavens proclaim God as judge? <laughs> Acts chapter 17, 31 makes it even more explicitly clear, and even some of the setup of it. It says, Because he, the Father, has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness. So therefore, he's not going to judge in what? Unrighteousness? <laughs> By the man, that is Jesus, he has appointed. We know it's Jesus because of what he says here. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him, that is the man, that is Jesus, from the dead. So God, if this were true, couldn't judge anyone, and yet Scripture says he will. And Scripture says he's just. And in fact, if this were true, we should try to do more evil than so that good would come of it, right? If this were true. How many of you know we were going to like talk in philosophical circles here with Paul? That's kind of what we're stuck with. Um, this is what Paul's doing. And part of why Paul's doing this, in case you're looking at me like, Pastor, this is not your normal kind of sermon. Part of why Paul's doing this is he wants to make sure and make abundantly clear that what God is doing is right. That God does not forsake any of his promises. And to reveal exactly the nature of our God. That's important, isn't it? If we worship the one true God, we should know who He is, shouldn't we? That's what Paul's trying to reveal here by dealing with these arguments that some would use to slander and blaspheme and disparage our God. And so this becomes important. But, those who engage in this kind of reasoning, Paul says, simply deserve to be judged. And the last part of Romans 5, 8 says, Let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is deserved. Period. I find it interesting. He's been willing to deal with the argument up to this point, right? He's been interacting with it. He's been responding to it. But at this point, he just doesn't even want to deal with it. It's like, you know what? That's ridiculous. To say that, let us do evil so that good may come. That's crazy talk, isn't it? And yet, how often have we seen that in our world? Well, I'll tell this lie so that I can get this result, and that'll be okay because the result's good. By the way, how many of you know about the Left Behind books? Okay, good. I figured most of you did. I stopped. I, I've never finished the series. Here's why. I got really frustrated with those who were his believers because they would tell lies to accomplish good. I just kept, after so long, I'm like, you're supposed to be following God. You're supposed to be the follower of God. And you think by telling lies to accomplish good, that's okay. That's not what this says, is it? No. So what do we do with this knowledge? What do we do with this stuff that we've just talked about? I mean, it's a big question. The first thing I think we need to do is recognize that false conclusions can be drawn from Scripture, can't they? If your con conclusion that you based on portions of truth would impugn God's character or promote evil, it's probably wrong, isn't it? Fair to say, right? And yet, I have heard and listened to sermons where that has been said. If you, you, you know that's the case and that's possible, then what, we, what do we need to do based on conclusions that we get? We need to test them. We need to examine the conclusions that we draw from Scripture to see if Scripture supports it. 
See, this is what the, what the danger is, right? I can take a verse, I can take a group of verses, I can take sections, I can take a whole bunch of them, and I can make a conclusion. And now I know why I heard the sermon that I heard on the way here this morning in three minutes. I heard a three-minute portion of a sermon, and as I listened to it, the guy just kept quoting section after section of Scripture. It was all Scripture. And it was all out of context. <laughs> but all he was saying was God's words. And he was making a lie by quoting the Bible. It's disturbing, isn't it? But that's what he did. And he just kept quoting passage after passage and only small segments. But I knew everywhere that it was in. I'm like, yep, there you are, there you are. And I'm like, wait a minute. What are you doing? We need to test our conclusions that we get as we study his word. As we hear sermons, as we listen to somebody talking about God, we need to test those things to be sure that they're really what it says. Or maybe I should say what it means, right? Because the guy quoted scripture. It was technically what it said. It just wasn't at all what it meant. By the way, the sermon was on 700 WLW in Cincinnati, so I have no idea who the guy was, but I was driving in three minutes of that sermon. That was all I needed from that guy. We need to test those things. We need to be sure about them. We need to remember that our own personal logic will fail us, won't it? It's going to fall short, especially in comparison to God's, right? Right? Scripture says his ways are higher than ours, beyond ours. Our minds are still being renewed, right? Still being changed. One other part about that, our minds are finite. I don't care how smart of a guy you are, woman you are. It's limited. It all fits in here. That means there's only so much. God's wisdom, his knowledge is infinite. His understanding just blows ours to pieces. And so if we have a problem with God's word, or we have a problem with his character, where do you think the problem is? Is it with God or with us? Us. And yet why is it so often that we see people blaming God then? That's what we see. It happens in our churches sometimes. Blaming God for something. Rather than saying, hmm... And it's a natural response, isn't it? I mean, humanly speaking, it's a natural response. It's just an inappropriate response. Rather to look at God and say, God, what I know about you is this, this, and this. What I don't understand is this. <laughs> but I know this is true. And so my understanding of this has to line up with what I know to be true, right? Has to. I can't tell you how many times I've had to do that. Where I'm here, and I feel this way, and God, you're wrong. And then I look at what I know about God. By the way, David does that all the time, doesn't he? Have you read a lot of those Psalms? Where he starts off complaining to God, and he starts off telling God, God, you don't know what you're doing. Look at the situation I'm in. It's like everybody's mocking me. They're all trying to kill me, God. I'm in trouble. Where are you? Why don't you listen to my prayers? And halfway through, he starts to think on who God is. That's really helpful, right? When we think on what we do know the truth about God. Not what we think or what we feel, but what we know. And that's where David starts. In the middle, he gets to that point. He starts with what he feels and what he thinks. And he moves to what he knows. And from what he knows, then, this is what I think is so beautiful about so many of these psalms, is he ends up praising God and having peace. Now, it's beautiful, because it all happens in what, like ten verses, right? I don't know about you, it never happens for me in ten verses. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a lot longer than that. But that's the goal of where we need to pursue. Making sure we line up 
and making sure where we have a problem with His Word or with God, that we check ourselves and make sure we know where He is. Some final conclusions then. Some final things. I have three things I want you to make sure, apart from everything else, that you hopefully would take these things home with you from what we've talked about. God cares as much about the means to the end as He does about the end. In fact, when I was an artist, I started realizing as an artist, as, as I was pursuing my bachelor's degree, that I was all about process. I was all about the, the method. The, what was involved in that, and not necessarily always even in the end product. Now, God is concerned with the end product. But as I began to do that, I realized how much the process is a beautiful thing. And the changing of John from where he started to where he is is a beautiful picture. Isn't it, John? Now, it's not enjoyable always, but it's a beautiful picture. To be able to look back even right now where he is, knowing he's an unfinished product, but where God started him at and where he is today, it's like, wow. I'm starting to see what you're doing here, God. Okay, this is starting to make a little bit of sense. Now, of course, a year from now, John may be in the heap of trying to get something chipped off. (laughs) And he's like, what is this about, God? This makes no sense. And that's what happens, right? We think we see the beauty, beauty of where we are at the moment when things are going great and we can look back and say, what a beautiful thing has been done in my life. And then in the midst of what appears to be horror, we think, God, you don't know what you're doing. And that's where we have to go back to reevaluating, don't we? And looking to Him and not at our circumstances. The how and the why of what's happening is just as important as the what that we're saved. Sin has never been and never will be condoned by God. And God keeps His promises. This is that final part. God keeps His promises. And He follows through with His warnings. Even if they go unheeded. Just because we don't listen doesn't mean He won't do it. How many of you understand that with children? (laughs) That, oh, well, I didn't hear you. Does it matter? Well, you, I, you never told me. Yes, I did five times. And guess what? Did you say, oh, well, you didn't hear me, so you're not punished? How many of you let that go there? Well, because you didn't hear me. Okay. No. At least most of the time, right? Maybe there's the rare occasion where you're like, yeah, I can buy it. The kid probably really didn't hear me. But most of the time, it's an excuse, isn't it? I didn't know that was wrong. Really? How do you not know taking money out of the purse wasn't a good idea? Well, you never told me not to. You know, those kind of things don't need to be said, do they? They're understood. And so many times you've done things to demonstrate truth. And then the kid still disobeys. Here on this Father's Day, I think that's a great opportunity for us to think about that. As a dad, what would you have allowed? And did you still love your kid? And how many times as a father did you have to do something that for the kid seemed harmful? Right? But was for their benefit. The prayer and the hope is that as they grow, as they get older, they understand that it was done out of love. That they might turn and follow God. Well, in the same way, God disciplines us. He allows things to happen that they might shape us. It's interesting, James in James chapter 1 verse 3 doesn't say, consider it all joy when things are going great. That's what I wish he would say. Because I'm, I'm good at that. I can consider great things all joy. By the way, that's why this has been a really good time being here. Because since I've been here, things are great. I'm loving being here at Eagle Creek. And so I can consider this all joy. Boy, it was a whole lot harder the last several years. Where things weren't great. And I kept reading that passage from James chapter 1 verse 3. Consider it all joy when you face trials and tribulation. Oh, God, that's not what I want. How many of you want trials and tribulation? Just pile them on, right? 
I, I can tell you want them. I'm looking, I, I can just see it on your face. You're like, bring it on. Trials and tribulation. No, none of us are signing up for that, right? If I said there's a sign up, sign up sheet out at the office, right on the front door, for anyone who wants to sign up for a few extra trials and tribulation, we'll be passing them out next week. Who'd be signing up? You see what I'm getting at? And yet James says this is what we should consider joy, with joy. We should look at those and say, thank you, Lord. You're doing something. Peter talks about how that produces growth. John talks about the the advantage of it. Over and over, we're told that that's the good thing. That's going to change us. Sometimes I'm like, just slow down the change a little bit, God. Let's take it in smaller increments, please. But he knows. My dad, having lost his wife at the end of February, in April, had something go wrong with his right eye and couldn't see out of it all of a sudden and had to have an eye surgery. And they said, well, within a week's time, you'll have your eyesight back and no problem. Wednesday, my dad went in to see the eye doctor. They put up the eye chart for him to read and he couldn't see the chart. So they came closer with a hand. They took the hand and showed him their hand and said, how many fingers am I holding up about this far away? He said, Tom? He goes, I guessed, but I guess right. (laughs) Like, Dad, this is not the time to guess. This isn't a pass-fail thing. (laughs) Like, they need to know that you didn't know what the fingers were. He goes, I couldn't see the hand, Tom. That's not good. They've been working on this hand. He go, and he told me, he goes, Tom, he goes, you know, I know God knows what he's doing. But if it were me, he goes, I would have separated this out a little further from your mom's death. I would have pushed that a little further down. He goes, I figured that's enough trial for me for right now. He's like, but God knows what he's doing. I was like, yeah, my dad's really depressed. <laughs> really depressed. He's struggling. And a lot of times I get these phone calls because we got him to make an agreement. And I said, Dad, I know there are times you just don't want to talk about it. I said, but when you're to that point where you don't want to talk about it, but man, you need something, you just call me. And you say, I can't talk, but I need prayer. And so that's what he does. I get a lot of those calls. Or messages when I can't take it. It's like, Tom, I can't talk, but I need prayer. You know what I mean. And he hangs up. And yet here he is with this eye problem that at this point they're saying it could be eight to ten months if he ever gets his eyesight back in that eye. And he says, God knows what he's doing. You know, folks, whatever situation we're in, whatever struggle we have, God knows what he's doing. He is in control. He is good. And if we're his, he has promised that it is for our benefit. When we disagree with that, it's not him that's out of line. It's us. And that's hard to admit. And it's hard to watch. And it's hard to endure sometimes. But he's promised that. And that's what we can hold on to in the midst of the storm.